Hello everyone, welcome to the review of lesson two of the environment topic. So uh, evidence for a changing atmosphere. Okay then, here we go. Before we did the lesson, I sent out this as a stimulus, this for you to lot to be thinking about. And basically what we were trying to achieve in this lesson. We were trying to look to see what evidence proves that the atmosphere has changed over an extended period of time, i.e. the last thousands, millions of years. I set you a task of making a resource. I gave you creative freedom to make it into whatever you wanted. So let's have a look at some of your work. There are some particularly lovely examples of this work. When I set this work, I also sent you a document to help you improve your work as well. So what we're going to do, as we look through these awesome examples, I'm going to tick off what they have done and highlight what extra they could include to make it even better. So this one here provides us with a lovely overview of the three pieces of evidence that we discussed in the lesson. I particularly like how in red they've actually shown the issues there, the problems caused by using that type of evidence. So here we go. What have they got? Have they got an introduction? No. So they could have maybe added one of those to make it even better. Diagrams and pictures. They've definitely got some pictures. They're not scientific diagrams, but they do add a nice aesthetic to the piece. We've not mentioned jobs and careers or why it's important to use as many pieces of evidence. They've not mentioned peer review, but they have given a disadvantage for both tree rings and coral and they've actually shown it there in red so it shows up really nicely there. They've already met two of the criteria. This was just to help you push your project to a more detailed and higher level. As you can see on this one, they produced a really nice poster. If they wanted to improve their work further, they could potentially include an introduction, an evaluation of which source of evidence they think is best. This next one is a really nice example of a word process document in which they've covered tree rings, coral, ice cores, and some additional source of evidence. So if they were trying to improve their work even further, well actually, on the improvement criteria, they've already included two extra pieces of evidence, the idea of seasonal shift and the idea of rising sea levels. Granted, they aren't particularly detailed, they have gone to the effort to find more pieces of evidence. So they included a nice summary for each one and actually two additional pieces of information here. If they wanted to improve their resource even further, I'd first advise using a spell checker. Now, something that I occasionally do when students have written large pieces of text like this, and I'm not sure whether or not they've copied and pasted or written it, what I can actually do is copy and paste that into Google and see what they have done. Uh oh, it looks like somebody has done a copy and paste job here, ladies and gents. Oh dear. Uh oh, look, copy and paste. Right then, ladies, gents, girls, boys and others, what this is, is an example of something called plagiarism. So if you take something off the Internet and try to pass it off as your own, that is called plagiarism. And you have plagiarized somebody else's work. Now, if you do that at university or if you do that in a professional capacity, um, you can actually get kicked out of university and it can be very, very serious. So. What I'd like you to do in future, if you are going to use the internet as a resource, try to limit it to maybe only one or two sentences and then reword it in your own ways. If you are going to use an extended piece of text like this, it might be best to break it up a little bit. 
So for example, this bottom bit isn't necessarily relevant just to tree rings. So let's get rid of it. It's very rare we start a sentence with because, so let's get rid of that. So what would be nice to do is what you can do at this point is put this in quotation marks. And then we can do something called referencing. Now, this is a very simplified version of referencing. All that I'm going to do is take that sentence from that website and copy and paste the link underneath. That shows that you have taken that from somewhere else and that you are not claiming that you wrote that yourself. And then this bit here, it's easy enough to actually rewrite in your own words. let's delete that old bit there. So all that I've done there is, yes, I've copied and pasted this bit as a direct quote, not made any changes to it, put quotation marks around it and put a link in. And then the other sentence that was still very good, what I've done is read it and reworded that. So not only now have I not plagiarised this work, but I've also thought about what I'm writing and reworded that. And that is what we call active learning. OK, just copying and pasting from somewhere else. That's easy to do. You're not thinking about what you're doing. However, rewording something that somebody else is doing, whether it be just simple rewording the sentences like this or restructuring on a poster or making into bullet points. That is active learning and is much more beneficial. So to make their resource even better, they should rewrite it in their own words using quotation marks and referencing where necessary. It would also be quite nice if they included some diagrams. Now, diagrams and pictures, if used from the internet, you can reference it in the same way that you would do for a small quote. One thing that would make this even better as well is if they talk about the advantages and disadvantages of each source of evidence. Here's an example of a beautifully handwritten one that's included some pictures that they printed out and stuck on. What a great idea! Their leaflet went over a few pages, so I've just copied and pasted some of their images. So I've talked about ice cores here and used the notes from the previous lesson to help fill all this in. And look, they have got problems with it, therefore, a disadvantage. They've also included uh, careers related to this field, super duper tree rings with a labelled diagram, the ideas about the weather and the disadvantage there, coral reefs with the problem. So this piece of work is already incredibly strong. They've got diagrams and pictures, they've got jobs and careers linked to it, they've given some disadvantages of the pieces of evidence, so they've already ticked off three big sections here in how can they make their resource even better. It might be nice to improve this one further if they include a little evaluation at the end where they say which source of evidence they think it is best, but then justify it in terms of actually it's more important to use lots of pieces of evidence together. And then talk about ruling out bias and potentially mention peer review. Here's another lovely example of a handwritten leaflet. That's the front cover, and here's the inside. 
So a fantastic overview of the three types of evidence that we discussed in lesson, very neat presentation and including uh, diagrams there. How can they make this even better? It's already pretty darn good. They've already got diagrams and pictures and really nice details, including some chemical names. So we've got CO2, carbon dioxide and methane mentioned there. But they've clearly done some extra research to help them do this. So if this student again wants to go above and beyond, again, we'd be looking at adding an evaluation of which source of evidence they think is best and talking about the advantages and disadvantages of each source. As with the previous one, if they wanted to push it even further, they could link the idea of which source they think is best to the idea that we've got to use as much evidence as possible. Here's another word process one. Now the last word process one copied and pasted from the internet. Should we see if this one's done the same? No, it does not look like this one has copied and pasted from the internet. So well done for not being a naughty little sausage there. Well done. So let's have a look what went well in this example here. They've got a fantastic diagram. So we can already actually tick off the diagram and pictures here. They've labelled it themselves. Lovely. They've identified how tree ring evidence is used. They've got a really cool diagram here. Now, so once again, what they really should have done um, by using this diagram is wherever that diagram came from, they just need to put a little link underneath to the website where they got it from. That just shows where they've got it from and ensures that they are not plagiarizing somebody else's work. Nice cause here, fantastic picture. Here we go. This one's actually still got the link there. So what I could do here is actually type that out underneath just to show where I got that picture from. A nice little description of how this source of evidence is used. So a lovely breakdown there of the different sources of evidence. How could they make it even better? I think even better if for this one would be the advantages and disadvantages of each source of evidence. For all the examples that we've seen there, they clearly watched the webinar and they did all make a resource to inform people about the evidence that shows how the atmosphere has changed. So all of them have successfully completed the original task and some of them have even completed higher level tasks that I suggested in the Even Better If document. Recap time. So now we've seen some great examples of these. What we're going to do is a super quick recap of these different pieces of evidence just to ensure that everyone's got the key notes that they need. Tree rings. We've seen this representation a few times now. This is a new example that I've not shown you before, but it's a very similar idea. So thickness relates to good growing conditions. And this one even shows, look, a little scar from a forest fire and different seasons as well. So the big thing about tree rings, thick rings equals good conditions. What do we mean by good conditions? Well, we mean the factors needed for photosynthesis and growth in plants. So lots of sunlight photosynthesis. Plentiful water, but not too much, because if there's too much, that'll lead to mold growing and it'll damage the tree and become weak. Little pollution or no pollution and plentiful nutrients. Tree rings is an example of weak qualitative evidence. So this is a higher level skill being able to categorize the type of evidence you have got. This is a qualitative evidence because it gives us an idea of what's there, but it doesn't actually give us any numbers. So it'll give us a rough idea of the growing conditions, but I can't use it to say, for example, in this year, 125 millimetres of rain fell. I can't do that. All I can say is that there was probably a decent bit of rain. It's weak data because it doesn't give us specifics. It just gives us a rough idea. And also, this, the retrieval of this evidence 
can be damaging to the tree. As some of you have done some extra research, you may have found ways of harvesting this evidence without killing the trees. But it's still tricky to do right. Coral. These are the sketches that I did in the lesson where we talked about the evidence. And we can see here a little idea of there being a balance between what chemicals are in the air and what is in the water. So if there's pollution in the air, there'll be pollution in the water. Sulfur dioxide and carbon dioxide are particularly well absorbed by water and they will react to form two different acids, sulfuric acid and carbonic acid. These chemicals, along with any other pollution that are in the water at the time, get soaked in to these new bands of coral as those new bands are being formed. So the larger the coral, the older the record. The coral bands absorb chemicals when they are formed. This is an example of strong qualitative data. It's qualitative again because it doesn't give us any specific numbers. I can't easily say the exact concentration of the chemicals in there. Therefore, it's qualitative data because there are no numbers. However, it is what we call strong qualitative data because what you can do to the little bits of coral that you harvest is test them with chemicals. If you do a chemical test, for example, if we are testing for the presence of Copper, for example, with copper you can add sodium hydroxide, which is an alkali, and if copper is present, it will form a blue solid called a precipitate. So you can prove that specific chemicals are present. It is tricky to do it in a numerical fashion. And once again, this is quite harmful, okay? Harvesting the coral is potentially dangerous. If you've damaged the coral, it will not be able to grow, and therefore that will impact the ecosystem in a big way. Not to mention the idea that we are losing this source of evidence already through coral bleaching, which is caused by the acidification of the ocean. To find out more about coral bleaching and the effect this is having, uh, David Attenborough did a, a documentary on this, but other scientific researchers have done as well. This is just one of many examples that might be cool to check out. The ice cores. If you go to Google and search on Google Images for ice cores, one of the things that comes up is this poster. Now, this company, uh, Compound Chem, they're really cool. They do all sorts of different posters based on chemistry and the atmosphere, the environment, but also food, construction, industry, loads of different stuff. And they're really worth checking out. This poster is their detailed analysis of how ice cores tell us about the history of our atmosphere. I've shared this on Edmodo for my students. It's well worth checking out. So the brief points covering ice cores. Cores of ice are extracted from the Arctic and then analysed. This is an example of strong quantitative evidence. You can use both chemical tests to qualitatively confirm that a specific chemical is present, and then you can further analyse the concentration of that chemical within that ice core. So you might find that there are a hundred parts per million of carbon present in a sample. That might lead scientists to conclude that volcanoes were active at this time. Because this is numerical data, we can call it quantitative, as in a quantity. One of the great things about ice cores, they have been undisturbed for a long period of time. The further down you go, the older the sample is. Once again, there are some fantastic documentaries and informative videos about ice cores. Here are a few of them there. I've put a load of the videos for these lessons on a playlist on YouTube, and I will link to this at the end of this video. So what have we learned? We've learned that ice cores, tree rings, and coral can give us evidence for a changing atmosphere. We have learned that some of these pieces of evidence are better than others. We have learned the value of peer review and using as much evidence as possible to confirm findings. Non-scientific skills that we uh, happen to have stumbled across as well is the idea of referencing. So if you use a resource from the internet, it is very important that you give credit to the owners of that source of information. 
and we also had a look at different jobs that we can find within the chemical industry and beyond. I hope you found these lessons useful. Feel free to pop a comment below, feel free to subscribe and do get in touch if you are struggling with any of this content. Be gone, minions of science! Be gone! Bye!